a town, on a boat from the southern islands, sailing the reach before a following sea. She was making for the trades on the outside, and the downhill run to Papa Ede, off the wind. Welcome to the American Writers 100 Pages at a Time podcast. My goal is to read and interpret American writers as completely and systematically as possible. Rather than randomly reading the most famous novels and stories in a haphazard fashion, we'll strive for completeness, even if that goal takes a very long time. This will mean examining authors from many backgrounds and in as many time periods as possible. In order to put some discipline on this project, we will take the Library of America as our goal, as our tool. Beginning publication in 1982, the Library of America is a nonprofit publisher of American writers. They share a goal of completeness, thoroughness, and diversity among both writers and genres. I do not work for them, and I'm not sponsored by them. I'm merely a fan of their project. With over 250 volumes in print, most containing numerous works by individual authors, our job of collecting materials is done for us. Now, while a chronological approach may be preferable for students of history or for the history of literature, the Library of America is constantly publishing new volumes. For this reason, we will simply begin with Volume 1, including Herman Melville's earliest works, Taipei, Omu, and Marty. And from there, we'll take up volumes where we can, starting with those we have access to. We will try to handle around 100 pages of text per episode, sometimes doing a little bit more and sometimes a little bit less. I plan to complete about two episodes a week, which will mean I can complete about one volume of the Library of America a month. The rub is that at, 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 at this schedule is that the Library of America publishes between 10 and 15 volumes a year. Alas, I will not finish. But there are worse things to be condemned to do than read American writers. I will not interpret these works through any specific analytical or theoretical model, except those that come to me when I examine texts. I will only say that I believe American writers tend towards positions that value equality, freedom, and solidarity. And in an age of growing political divisiveness, where anxieties about the future of American democracy are commonplace among those on the left, right, and center, I would like to use American writers as a source of consolation and inspiration. I should also add that while I try to avoid the more disgusting aspects of patriotism, I do believe that American writers collectively have produced the greatest literature in human history. I'll speak more on my mission and values in coming episodes, but for now it's enough to say that I'm looking to understand America's relationship to freedom through the works of their writer of its writers. I want to understand and discuss their faults without cynicism. So with that, let us begin with Herman Melville and Taipei. Melville was born in 1819 in New York City. His father was a merchant. In 1832, his father died and Melville had to enter the workforce. The family was left deeply in debt. He grew up during what historians of the United States have called the market revolution. Over the course of a generation, farmers and workers found themselves brought into a national market thanks to canals, the telegraph, and eventually railroads. At the same time, Americans, both slave and free, moved to the West. Throughout the 1830s, Melville worked various jobs, clerking for a bank for a while and then even teaching at a grammar school. It is impossible to deny that Melville's life was shaped by the sea. He took his first job as a sailor in 1839 on a transatlantic trip to Liverpool event which influenced the writer writing of his later novel, Redburn. This was not an uncommon experience for young American men. He did not commit immediately to a life at sea. He would spend another year teaching and even taking time to travel the Mississippi on a steamboat. His experience with the market revolution was complex. On the one hand, Melville was working in the Atlantic economy, but on the other, he looked inland to the West, working in the very industries that helped modernize the American economy, education, and banking. Just two examples of that. In 1841, he journeyed to New Bedford looking for a job. He found one on a whaling ship where he would receive the 175th lay. That is one hundred and one one hundred seventy fifth of the profits of the voyage. If this does not seem like much, it really wasn't. If a whaling ship could make a profit of around $50,000, and I looked it up, that was fairly reasonable, Melville would have made just shy of $300. 
Mill Girls and Lowell at the same time were making about 50 cents a day, minus the boarding fees they had to pay. A skilled carpenter could make about $1.40 a day. Now, in any case, it was a gamble on how profitable, profitable the voyage would be. Melville would make a point of complaining about this wage structure in Moby Dick. Um, the voyage is of crucial importance to Melville's literary career, largely because he abandoned his duty. Along with another sailor, he deserted the ship on July 9, 1842. He would then live in the Marquesas, finding safety with the local people of Nukahiva. And after a month there, he found work on an Australian whaler passing by. Now we can leave Melville's life aside here. Before writing Taipei in 1846, Melville would have other adventures in the Pacific, but since these are recorded in his other major book, Omu, we'll hold those off for another episode. Taipei begins with a series of contrasts between the Westerners and the people of the Pacific. In particular, those of the Marquesas, a people who will form a central part of our story. These semi-fictional accounts will be interspersed with commentary from historical sources. It does seem that Melville is presenting these stories as real, even modeling his tale off the then popular travelogues. The hero and narrator of the story is initially unnamed. He later takes the name Tomu, but that's the name given to him by the Taipei. He's a sailor on a whaling ship, and he's thinking of desertion. He cannot point to any specific vi violence or any particular harsh treatment. He's just tired of the long voyage, the poor food, and the uncouth nature of his shipmates. These conditions make even the most sensible person cruel, as suggested in the story of the final chicken on the ship, a poor creature named Pedro. When Pedro is killed, the crew hopes the ship will finally return to port. But there's something bleak about that requiring the killing of the last human, non-human life on board. Now, when Melville flips his focus to the Marquesas, we are not presented with an island paradise contrasted with the bleak and artificial life of the ship. No, we are given a society already corrupted and damaged by empire and commerce. It started with the whaling, continued with the missionaries, and ended with violence, empire, and the hoisting of the French tricolor flag. On the French conquest, Melville writes, To be sure, in one of their efforts at reform, they had slaughtered about 150 of them at Wittihu, but let that pass. But Melville intersperses this horror with funny stories of cultural misunderstandings regarding clothing and tattoos. In one story, islanders are horrified and offended at a missionary wife for covering too much of herself. But in another, French sailors are scandalized when an islander queen reveals the tattoos on her backside. So next, Melville describes their arrival at the Marquesas. The crew see the beauty of the island, and then they're reminded of the imperial context when they see six French warships. Melville makes it clear that he sees this as an upsetting contradiction. In the port, we meet the first of several suspicious vagabond Westerners who appear in Melville's Pacific stories, particularly in Omu. This one is a drunken pilot. He has deserted an English vessel to live in the Marquesas and flee punishment for crimes. He's been hired by the French to serve as a pilot. The next episode is the conquest of their ship, the Dali, by mermaids, or the women of Nukahiva, who arrive at the ship. It is a beautiful scene in which our hero sees coconuts floating towards the ship. As they come closer, he notices that the coconuts are being brought over by men who have come to sell the fruit. The next to arrive are women, Melville's mermaids. They skillfully board the ship. The ship, of course, surrenders to these fair conquerors. The freedom described in this passage is a wonderful moment of, of Americana. Melville cannot help to use this moment to criticize empire once again. The freedoms of the girls of Nukahiva are turned into debauchery by the unholy passions of the crew. The sentence describing this encounter was removed from the original publication of the book, but thankfully it appears in recent editions. Not the feeblest barrier was interposed between the unholy passions of the crew and their unlimited gratification. He ends the second chapter wishing that Empire had never come to the Marquesas at all. Now, of course, we have to unpack this moment. Not surprisingly, Melville is not direct about the sexuality at the heart of the encounters. He never denies the titillating nature of these women, young girls in fact. There is no sign of violence or rape taking place, but rather suggestions of purity and innocence lost. Now is Melville being presumptuous to assume that it was empire that corrupted these young women? His emphasis on their innocence is a bit hard to swallow for modern readers. It is, after all, preposterous to assume that it took American sailors to teach the women of Nukahiva the birds and the bees. However, I wonder if the point is more subtle. 
It is not the sexuality of the encounters that's the problem. It is that Americans and Europeans, through their sexually repressed upbringing, transformed a beautiful example of liberated sexuality into crude vulgarities. Now, while without being too sophisticated, it seems that it's the fun and joy of the moment that's being corrupted, not really the women. Melville has more to say about the encounter between the West and the South Pacific. He documents the conquest of Tahiti. Here we can let the author speak for himself. They quarterly hated them, but the impulses of their resentment were neutralized by the dread of the floating batteries, which lay with their fatal tubes, ostensibly pointed, not at fortifications and redoubts, but a handful of bamboo sheds, sheltered in a grove of coconuts. He later ponders why it is that the authors of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, you know, the French, could be capable of such conquests. In Chapter 4, Melville lays out a couple arguments about resistance. The first, and, and most direct to our plot, is why our hero must desert. A second, under-the-surface argument, is why the people of Nukihiva perhaps should resist empire. Like a good American, aware of the Declaration of Independence, he realizes that rebellion must be preceded by facts presented to a candid world. For our hero, the main reason for his revolt is that his captain betrayed the contract by not maintaining good conditions on the ship and staying too far from home. He reminds us of stories of ships away too long that got lost at sea and still sail around, quote, Buggery Island. We know there are deeper reasons. He's deeply offended by his vulgar shipmates. He ponders mutiny, but rejects it for this reason. He simply feels he cannot trust them. When pondering what fate will meet him on Nukahiva, he introduces the readers to the Taipei, apparently a tribe of cannibals. Our narrator uses the Taipei to prove to the reader how bad things are on the ship, because otherwise, why would someone risk encountering cannibals? He hopes instead to encounter the more peaceful Hapar people who dwell in another valley. Now, this is all myth and story that they're getting by this point. Now, in one story you heard, the narrator speaks of an English captain who escaped being consumed by the goodwill of a Marquesan Pocahontas. Now, he is clear here. The violence of the Taipei is real, but it is as much a product of European colonization as it is of a backward culture. He speaks of the Taipei resistance to the American expedition to conquer the Valley of the Taipei. How often is the term savages incorrectly applied? None really deserving of it were ever yet discovered by voyagers or by travelers. None of this academic awareness of the brutality of Europeans gives the narrator much comfort regarding their, his possible fate on the island, however. So with this, Melville sets aside his critique of the hypocrisy of empire for a while and focuses on his narrative of escape and survival. The narrator decides that desertion will require a companion, and he chooses Toby. While capable of a temper, Toby has a sarcastic humor and was dependable. Now, After listening to a pompous speech by the captain, the two set off for shore leave and escape into the forest during a strong rain. What follows is a brutal few days of rain, hunger, and danger. Our narrator injures its leg during these adventures, likely from a snake bite. Over everything is a fearsome choice. Do they seek the help from the local people, knowing there's a 50% chance that they'll run into the cannibal Taipei? Melville does an excellent job of making us feel the sailor's misery during these long few days. A theme comes up once or twice during this journey. Melville seems to be foreshadowing Churchill's statement that when you enter hell, the best thing to do is to keep going. Whether this can be taken as a metaphor for American empire or westward expansion or capitalism or anything else is a question I'll just leave aside. Melville writes on this, There is scarcely anything when a white man is in difficulties that is more disposed to look upon with abhorrence than a right about retrograde motion, a systematic going over of the already trodden ground. Later, this dilemma takes the form of whether the duo should report, report, approach a village, not knowing the identity of the inhabitants. Forced by lack of food and general misery, they do enter the village and discover they discover in a valley. Before long, they're introduced to the chief of the village named Mahevia, and they learn that they are indeed in the land of the Taipei. The narrator is given the name Tomu, and they are given a feast of islander food. Mahevi tries to learn what Tomu knows about the French, and finally they are given a place to sleep. The next chapter, and the final one we'll look at in this episode, is mostly about Tomu being introduced to the people of the Pacific. The first to arrive are curious young women who decorate their house with flowers. Toby is a bit scandalized by their forwardness, and even the narrator admits to being uncomfortable with their hospitality, but he really can't see anything improper in their actions. 
Next, they meet a warrior heavily decorated with evidence of its kill, including sperm whale teeth and tattoos. These both impress and disgust the narrator. He soon recognizes this man as Mahevi, the chief, but now in full regalia. When he notices Tomu's injured leg, he calls for a doctor, and after a brutal and violent surgery, his leg is left to heal on its own. Mahevi introduces Tomu to a major domo named Kori Kori, who will serve the sailors in various ways throughout their stay. Tomu meets Kori Kori's family, his father Maheo, Maheo and his mother Tinor. He comments that Tinor is the hardest working person in the village. And so here we come to one of the most important themes of Taipei, the work ethic. It is not for nothing that the novel begins with an act of work resistance. While the narrator explains away his flight using various legal tricks, at the end, he was afraid of being bound for an unknown number of years of labor. In future novels, we'll see the same character flee work again and again. Above and beyond all other cultural differences, the one that may have fascinated Americans the most when reading Taipei or other accounts of the Pacific is that it seems the islanders do not work, or at least they do not work very hard. Even their work, such as the selling of coconuts, is almost a form of play in the eyes of the narrator. Melville admits that the work ethic has failed in the United States. When writing about Tinor's diligence, he adds, She could not have employed herself more actively had she been left an exceedingly muscular and destitute widow with an inordinate supply of young children in the bleakest part of the civilized world. We will keep this theme in mind as we learn more about Taipei in the second half of the novel. The final person Tomu meets in this chapter is Feiwei. Melville spends two pages praising her beauty, calling her directly a nymph of the valley, and she is only lightly tattooed. That's a point that makes her more attractive to, to the narrator. Rather than the more conventional storyline of Eden turning into civilization with all of its ills, Melville begins with imperialism, violence, capitalism, and sexual repression. After a brutal adventure in the rain with hunger, the narrator is reborn into a paradise of sorts. Of course, the novel does not end there, and Melville is not that simple in regard to the nature of the Taipei or of Tomu's desire to stay in the valley. But his life among the Taipei will be the focus of the next episode. Well, that does it for now. Now, my goal is to look at about 100 pages of text an episode, but I'll strive to find logical places to sign off for each episode. Well, thank you for listening. Please leave your comments, rate, or subscribe. You can email me at 100pagescast at gmail.com. Your input and ideas about these writers will really strengthen this podcast and help me build an audience. I'm especially interested in knowing more about how these American writers have influenced you. So I'll be back in 100 pages. Thanks for listening. Bye.